My name is Amanda Howell. I'm a managing attorney here in the lit litigation program at ALDF. I'd like to welcome you to the second panel discussion on our first day of the Animal Law Symposium, State Confinement Laws and the Future of Farmed Animal Policy. The instant panel will focus on litigation to defend Proposition 12 and Question 3. Just a reminder that the symposium is being recorded and will be shared with you later via email. While you're listening today, we'd really love it and I'd be personally very grateful if everyone entered any and all questions that you have into the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen. We'll be covering a big topic here today, but I promise we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. The session features closed, closed captioned subtitles. To enable this feature, click the upward arrow near the CC button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. If you would, please take a second to answer the poll question on your screen. If you are see seeking continuing legal education credits for this session, go ahead and click yes. Attorneys seeking credit will receive information via email after the symposium concludes. Okay, let's get started. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a lot to cover today, so I'll just briefly introduce our speakers. For their full and very impressive bios, you can see the symposium website. First, we have Scott Ballinger, Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. Next, we have Rebecca Carey, Special Counsel Farm Animals at the Humane Society of the United States. Next, we have Kelsey Eberly, Senior Attorney at Farm Stands. Uh, and last but not least, we have Ashton McFarlane, who is a Brooks Institute Emerging Scholars Fellow at Harvard Law School. So we just had an excellent panel det detailing the campaign efforts for state confinement related ballot initiatives. The NPPC decision that we'll be focusing on in this panel came over a decade after California began legislating against the production and sale of certain cruel products, including Prop 2 in 2008, AB 1437 in 2010, and then of course Prop 12 in 2018. Uh, Prop 12 was a ballot initiative that required farmers to provide minimum amounts of square feet to egg laying hens, calves raised for veal and breeding pigs. Under the law, producers have to verify that the eggs, veal, and pork they sell are from animals raised in accordance with Prop 12 square footage requ requirements. And while we'll be focusing on the NPPC case today, that's not the only active challenge to confinement and sales laws currently. We have the Iowa Pork Producers Association v. Bonta, which is right now a waiting decision in the Ninth Circuit. Um, and Triumph Foods v. Campbell, which is the question three uh, case in Massachusetts. And right now that's in the midst of a uh, summary judgment briefing. Um, we've also handily dealt with other past challenges to Prop 12, including National American Meat Institute v. Becerra. Um, and that brings us to defense of Prop 12 in the NPPC case. So for a bit of procedural history, after Prop 12 was passed in 2018, the National Pork Producers Council and the American Farm Bureau Federation filed the law a lawsuit in the Southern District of California against the California Department of Food and Agriculture and California Department of Pub Public Health, alleging violations of the Dormant Commerce Clause based on extraterritorial regulation and impermissible burden on interstate commerce. Uh, the district court said that Prop 12 was not violated uh, and it did not violate the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, in response, NPPC appealed to the Ninth Circuit. Uh, the Ninth Circuit regarding extraterritoriality held that a state law is not impermissibly extraterritorial unless it directly regulates conduct that is wholly outside of the state. As in, it's not extraterritorial simply because it regulates the sale of pork within California. Um, as to the burden on interstate commerce, the Ninth Circuit held that laws that increase compliance costs without more do not constitute a significant burden on interstate commerce. So again, Ninth Circuit held that Prop 12 does not violate the Dormant Commerce Clause. In response, NPPC sought review from the Supreme Court. Um, and in May 2023, we have the Supreme Court ruling and NPPC v. Ross upholding Prop 12, with, but with some interesting implications for the Dormant Commerce Clause and constitutional jurisprudence. Um, with that context in mind, let's get to the experts. And we'll be starting with Rebecca. Okay, Rebecca. NPPC v. Ross is a dormant commerce clause challenge. For those of us who haven't taken call on in a while, or even for those normal humans who aren't attorneys or law students, can you remind us uh, what, what the dormant, com dormant commerce clause is and explain exactly what the pork producers challengers were asserting in the case? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Amanda. Um, and thanks everyone for being here today. 
Uh, so uh, one of the most frequent questions we get asked is where exactly is the dormant commerce clause? Because if you haven't, um, if you're not a lawyer or haven't taken con law in a while, um, you might not know that the dormant commerce clause actually appears nowhere in the Constitution. Uh, what does appear in the Constitution, of course, is the Commerce Clause, and that's in Article 1, Section 8, uh, Clause 3. And what the Commerce Clause says um, is that, uh, is that Congre it's Congress that has the authority to regulate trade among the states. And that's long been understood by the Supreme Court uh, to uh, come with a certain uh, implied limitation on state and local regulation. Um, but I should note that there's been a lot of skeptics, um, including skeptics on the court of the Dormant Commerce Clause because it is not in the Constitution. So um, justices like, for example, Justice Gorsuch on the court now and the late Justice Scalia have been extremely skeptical of the Dormant Commerce Clause and cases related to it. In fact, Justice Scalia actually called it a judicial fraud. Um, so that's sort of what the Dormant Commerce Clause is. And then to get into just a little bit more detail about what the Port Council was claiming in this case, um, and Amanda um, introduced all of these concepts already, but I'll just sort of break it down a little bit further in case that's useful for folks. Um, so uh, essentially, the <laughs> if we if we step back from the constitutional arguments, what the what the Port Council is really saying in this case, and what they were trying to convince the court was that they have the absolute right to sell products in California and indeed in any state, no matter how cruelly that they they are produced, and that Californians and uh, residents of other states, if they have similar laws are totally powerless um, to exclude those products from their markets. Um, and they base this, as I've already said, in the Dormant Commerce Clause. So there are basically three things um, that are understood that states cannot do when they're passing, um, when they're passing laws that if they do them will violate the Dormant Commerce Clause. The first thing that they can't do, and really the main thing that the Dormant Commerce Clause is concerned with, is that they can't discriminate against other states or against market participants from other states. Um, that's, again, like I said, the biggest one, and it's not something that was issue at issue in this case, although it was at issue in a previous case um, that another group of pork producers brought um, and uh, challenged all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court did not grant cert in that case. Um, so it makes sense that the, that the Port Council did not bring a discrimination claim in this case, because as was mentioned at the beginning of this panel and probably by the previous panel as well, Proposition 12 treats all states and all market participants exactly equally. In other words, if you want to sell your products in California, they have to meet some very basic um, humane and health and safety standards. But as long as you meet those standards, whether you're a producer in Kansas or you're a producer in California, you can sell your products in the state. So there's not a discrimination problem. But there are two other things that states can't do when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the Dormant Commerce Clause. The first thing you can't do is regulate beyond your borders. Um, that's called extraterritorial regulation. And that was um, a huge part of the Port Council's claim in this case. Uh, essentially, what they were saying was that Proposition 12 um, inevitably affects commerce um, and it, it affects production methods in other states because uh, California produces very little pork. And so what these what these pork producers were saying was that inevitably California's law is going to force producers to change pork production methods in a way that uh, that complies with what California is asking for here. Um, and they further argued that it's just impossible for them to separate out California uh, pork that's destined for California 
from pork that's destined for other states that don't have laws like Proposition 12. Well, uh, we can get more into what the Supreme Court held on this, but essentially what the counter argument is to this and what the animal intervener groups in the state of California argued is that even if it's the case that it's hard to separate out products for California from other products, that has nothing to do with Proposition 12. That's essentially because the pork market has chosen this vertical integration structure um, and they've set themselves up in a way that makes it more difficult or impossible depending on uh, their arguments. And they've argued both throughout the course of the case, um, not a product of Proposition 12. And the other major problem with this Port Council argument is that um, it just doesn't reflect the reality of what's happened on the ground in California and other places. Um, we uh, provided information for the court that shows that major producers, including Hormel and other pork producers, are indeed able and willing to comply with Proposition 12, and that they're able to sell pork in California without a major hit to their bottom line. And of course, pork producers, like any other market, has been producing products that meet a variety of different standards um, before Proposition 12 and you know, long after as well. For example, producers produce products that are organic or antibiotic free, and they're able to separate out those products from their lines of more traditional products. Uh, so that's extraterritoriality. And then the third thing that you can't do under the Dormant Commerce Clause is you can't impose a substantial burden on interstate commerce that exceeds the local benefits of the law. That's often known as the Pike Balancing Test. And when it comes to that test, essentially what the Pork Council was arguing was not that their production practices um, uh, are not cruel, although there were, were some um, arguments that came up as to that. Essentially what they were saying was that um, any possible benefit that California had, and they don't think that California has one, of having this law is outweighed by the burden to producers who need to comply with this law if they want to sell in the state. Um, and uh, in other words, they were saying that there were a lot of compliance costs associated with Proposition 12 and converting their gestation crate facilities to group pens and things like that. Um, and that that was going to be such a cost that it was a burden, an insurmountable burden. Um, of course, there is lots of Supreme Court case law that says that um, those types of burdens on producers are just not enough when it comes to the Dormant Commerce Clause. The Dormant Commerce Clause cares about the market as a whole, not individual participants. Um, and as we pointed out to the court repeatedly, there are lots of benefits of Proposition 12, including preventing um, complicity of California residents in pro processes that they consider cruel, um, and some real public health benefits associated with not having cruel products in their marketplace. Um, so that's the burden versus benefit argument associated with that. I'll stop there. I should thank you for explaining things like extraterritoriality <laughs> and their state burden. I was just like, drop those. I was like, Hard to do I don't know. <laughs> thank you so much, Becca. Um, I think the next question I have is for Scott. Um, how did you think about the different justices going into NPPC v. Ross? Like, who did you think would be sympathetic to your side of the case and who would be sympathetic to the pork industries? It's a tricky case uh, in, in that respect, right? Because the, the justices don't necessarily break down along the, the predictable lines that, that everyone expects. Um, as, as Rebecca pointed out, um, my old boss, Justice Scalia, was you know, a very conservative guy, but thought that the Dormant Commerce Clause, just as a matter of constitutional principle, you know, doesn't really exist. Um, and there are you know, several of the, of the most conservative justices who have that view um, and who, who therefore you might think are you know, pretty good audience for a, a claim, a, a case like this one for the, the animal rights side, you know, maybe somewhat surprisingly. Um, you know, on, on the other, 
you know, end of the spectrum, you, you might expect that the the liberal justices, you, you know, are not going to be huge fans of the super concentrated meatpacking industry necessarily, um, and you know, might be, if nothing else, sort of temperamentally in, inclined to support the the democratic right of of Californians to make their own judgments about these sorts of things. So I, I guess I would say that that I was most worried. Uh, about the the middle of the court, the sort of chamber of the commerce, chamber of commerce middle of the court, uh, the chief justice, Justice Kavanaugh, um, you, you know the the folks who uh, are are sort of most likely to support big business and um, you know perceptions about uh, the most efficient economic alternative. Um, we, we sort of felt like. We had a good way of talking to the the right and the left, but that the center might be the problem. Does anyone have anything to to add there in terms of how they thought it was going to shake out versus how it did? If not, uh, I think I'm going to ask Becca another question. Uh, what kinds of strategies did the animal welfare intervener groups employ to kind of put themselves in the best position for a favorable outcome in the case? Yeah, sure. Um, so when we found out that the Supreme Court granted cert in this case, uh, to say that it caused a bit of a kerfluffle in the animal movement would be an understatement. Um, we immediately knew that although we were very confident of the merits of our case um, and our underlying strategy in approaching um, the various arguments we were going to need to, uh, the Supreme Court is obviously a whole dif different ball game, and one it's a it's a field we don't play in very often. Uh, and so we really needed to develop a full court press kind of strategy in order to make sure that we put ourselves in the best possible position to defend Proposition Twelve. Um, and again, um, we were uh, HSUS was an intervener in this case, along with a coalition of animal groups that had been. Um, proponents and supporters of Proposition 12. Um, and so we were able to lean a lot on some of our supporters and allies in, in coming up with a strategy. And it included um, a, a lot of different things. So um, one of the first things we did was do an awful lot of factual um, research into how justices had previously ruled on dormant commerce clause cases, um, other animal cases, really anything that we might we thought might be useful in trying to deduce what their position might be on this case. Um, we also hired outside counsel um, from a firm in DC um, that had an awful lot of experience with Supreme Court cases, and that's a majority of their practice. Um, uh, and uh, Jeff Lampkin, who ended up arguing on behalf of the uh, humane group interveners uh, has uh, almost more experience arguing in front of the court than anyone uh, we know. I think he's argued something like 30 cases or something, just almost 30 um, in front of the court. And so we felt that we were in really good hands, but for uh, well over a year, I don't know how long it was, we had these intense weekly, sometimes daily strategy meetings and conversations about what our brief was going to look like and what further research was needed. Um, and in addition to sort of the development of the actual brief itself that ended up being filed, uh, we also put an awful lot of thought into amicus strategy. And I know Ashton and Kelsey are going to talk a little bit more about that, so I won't go too far into it, except to say um, that uh, it wasn't an accident that a large number uh, of briefs were filed on our side in the Supreme Court. Um, that was a product of the Humane Society really sitting down and trying to go through the various arguments in the case, look at which ones might appeal to which justices, and then um, reach out to allies and partners and friends and friends of friends to see if um, what groups might be able to be the best messengers for those different points we wanted to make. Because of course, some, while some justices might be uh, amenable to hearing from the Humane Society on certain things that we might be expert on, 
um, other things might come better from different groups that appeal more to those just particular justices, sensibilities, or backgrounds, or beliefs. So we had a huge chart um, where we started going through different possibilities and reaching out to um, uh, potential folks who might want to submit an amicus brief and trying to um, help them figure out counsel for those briefs and things like that. Um, so I'm really proud of, of those efforts. And along with all of that, uh, there was at the same time, we had a lot of communication strategies going on. We had a full, um, uh, our, our comm shop was working full time in developing um, messaging documents and points to uh, put out to the public and to various strategic media places. Um, we also were doing a lot of outreach to congressional members and to the White House um, as we were trying to get the Biden administration uh, to side with us. Um, uh, so there was, <laughs> there was always a lot of moving pieces in this case, sort of from day one. Um, and that's, that's really just some of them. Can I jump in on the sort of how we felt um, when the Supreme Court took the case? I think it's maybe important to think about, you know, um, animal advocates' previous uh, forays um, in the Supreme Court, most recently, and in somewhat similar circumstances. So um, I think it was 2012, you know, California tried to kind of, again, step beyond the, the national floor with respect to farm animals and protect um, pigs who are too weak um, and sick to, to rise to their own um, slaughter and um, you know, tried to protect those animals and, Cal and um, the Supreme Court shot that down under um, a different constitutional provision. But, you know, um, and that decision, um, National Meat Association versus Harris was authored by um, Justice Kagan. And so again, to, to Scott's point, you know, I think we think about where the liberal, liberal justice is on these questions and that sometimes is hard to figure out, you know, um, so, I had lots of trepidation, you know, approaching, obviously, when um, the court uh, decided it wanted to take up the issue of California regulating farm animal issues again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can I just add, uh, I mean, I, I was a bit terrified, but, to be honest, because, you know, the court had passed up a, an opportunity, a good opportunity, to consider these issues in a, an original action brought directly by several Midwestern farm states in the Supreme Court a couple of years before. Um, and, you know, it's good to be the Supreme Court. They get to decide which cases they want to take, and they have to give permission for, for states to bring an original action in the Supreme Court. And they, you know, thought part about it, um, but ultimately denied uh, permission to bring that original action. And, you know, at, at that point, a lot of us, you know, I, I know, you know, breathed a sigh of relief that, it seemed like the Supreme Court had decided that, you know, the Ninth Circuit is probably right about this and it's not worth review. And when they suddenly granted review in the NPPC case, you know, it made us all wonder, gosh, has something changed? Mm -hmm. Sure. Kelsey, as Becca just mentioned, uh, like a lot of interested individuals and groups submitted amicus briefs to the Supreme Court. Can you summarize the interests and constituencies represented and kind of talk about the role the briefs played in the and the broader just public discussion surrounding that? Sure, yeah. And uh, major hats off to HSUS for all of that work, um, organizing, you, you know, reaching out to folks and, and making sure that the court was aware of just how many Kind of interests and constituencies would be uh, potentially affected by whatever it eventually did. Um, maybe stepping back and, and for non-lawyers, an amicus brief, as, as most people know, a friend of the court brief, any pretty much anyone can file a brief. Um, usually they're filed at the appellate level, basically, you know, giving your perspective and maybe giving a perspective that is a little bit different than, than the parties in the case and sort of making the court aware of some implication of the case that might not, you know, be immediately apparent from, you know, the party's briefs. Um, and in the Supreme Court, especially for big cases, you know, you see dozens of amicus briefs sometimes on each side. And in this case, obviously, was no different. Um, and the briefs, you know, on the state and um, humane groups side, uh, again, thanks in uh, no small part to, to a lot of, um, of outreach. Um, so, yeah, so basically the, the 
there were, you know, a number of amicus briefs um, in support of the pork council, I, I should note, and, and those kind of were about what you would expect, you know, kind of libertarian free market groups, pork producing groups, um, all those states who, who that Scott just mentioned that tried to get the Supreme Court to invalidate um, Prop 12, they again submitted amicus briefs in support of the pork council. Um, but on the other side of the V, um, uh, the um, California and, and the Humane groups were supported by 15 states. So another group of states that really want to preserve their ability to, um, you know, to protect their citizens and to pr protect animals, um, as well as uh, veterinarians, um, the National League of Cities and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. You know, I think there was so much at stake here for the ability to of state and local governments to regulate anything. <laughs> so they, you know, they wanted to step in and make make clear what was at issue. Um, religious scholars, economists, worker safety advocates, public health and food safety organizations, consumer protection advocates, farmers, small meat and dairy and egg producers, historians, um, and then lots of law produ uh, um, law professors who who like to submit lots of briefs in these cases. Um, but I think that that breadth and diversity really reflects again how much was at stake, um, how many different interests were you know implicated by what the Supreme Court was going to do. Um, my organization, when we used to be the Public Justice Food Project, we were the counsel for the uh, worker safety advocates, and we really highlighted you know the the health and safety, you know food safety and sort of disease prevention um, aspects of Proposition Twelve basically, you know, the direct link between intensive confinement of animals and the emergence of zoonotic diseases, you know, which again is like so relevant now as we're seeing, you know, a new bird flu inf infecting um, dairy workers. Um, so, you know, we highlighted that and then sort of linked it to, you know, the very real health benefits that, um, you know, swine slaughterhouse workers in California and auction workers you know, we're getting from Prop 12, and that really answered the Pork Council and its amici's um, sort of attempt to denigrate the public health benefits of the law. And, you know, many, many other briefs did a similar thing. And those briefs really mattered. I mean, during oral argument, several of the justices talked about the, you know, were lifting up arguments from the briefs. Um, both Justice Sotomayor and Justice Gorsuch sort of deliberately picked out pieces of, of the briefs. And so, you know, I think that bringing that multiplicity of perspectives to the court was incredibly important um, to, and I think probably had an influence on the final result. And can I just jump in and add one thing to that, um, if I may? Uh, yeah, I, I echo everything Kelsey said, and I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of my most favorite briefs, if anyone's uh, uh, curious, and I'll let um, I'll let Ashton talk more about um, the brief that that he filed. So I'm not going to talk about that one. But um, uh, like Kelsey said, it was such a wide coalition of different types of int interest groups that filed these briefs. Um, there is an especially interesting one filed by some conservative and religious thought leaders that really appeals, I think, to this idea um, that legislating for animal welfare um, and caring about animal welfare is nothing new. States have been legislating related to that and related to public health, safety, and morals uh, for, for hundreds, literally hundreds of years. Um, and that brief does an especially good job sort of laying out um, the some of the historical foundations of that and how it's tied to um, religious concerns as well. Um, we also had a number of briefs filed by industry on our side, which I think might really surprise some people. Um, so, for example, uh, Purdue Farms, uh, Nyman Ranch is a subsidiary of, of, uh, of Purdue Farms, which most people have heard of, um, and they filed a great brief on our side of the V that examined the way that they are already able to um, comply with Proposition 12 and how it's not a huge imposition on them. Um, and it it uh, wasn't just uh, pork producer groups, there were also egg, egg producers, um, including the Association of California Egg Farmers that had previously opposed us um, in a number of cases in the early days preceding um, Proposition 12, back when we were fighting 
uh, a lot of lawsuits at the Humane Society related to Proposition 2 and AB 1437. Um, and so to see um, some of those groups sort of come around and realize that sort of the, the humane writing on the wall, if you will, um, they've uh, uh, made some great progress and strides in cage-free eggs in the intervening years. Um, and so uh, Proposition 12, although we're focusing on the pork part right now for this discussion, obviously also um, relates to eggs and veal as well. Um, so it was just really exciting to have um, these types of voices uh, uh, in on the discussion. And like Kelsey said, you can see that reflected in oral argument and in the opinion um, where various justices reference those different briefs. Um, and the last one I wanted to highlight is an economist brief that was actually filed in support of neither party, um, which is the only one in the case that does that, but which really highlights uh, that some of the, um, the forecasting that the pork industry and that NPPC was doing related to price spikes, et cetera, um, were overblown and not supported uh, by the evidence and haven't, haven't come to pass. Let me mention one more, if I may, which is, I think, in some ways, the most important amicus brief filed in support of the Port Council, uh, and, it, and it was by the United States, uh, by the Biden administration. The, the Biden administration filed a, a brief saying that the Port Council has a viable pike balancing claim, meaning a, you know, a claim that the, the benefits of the law to Californians don't outweigh the burden on interstate commerce. And essentially, their argument was that there are no benefits. Um, because in the administration's view, uh, the philosophical preference that animals be treated humanely uh, in food production uh, doesn't count. Um, that that what the administration called merely philosophical preferences uh, have no place in dormant commerce doctrine. That, that the fact that they were filing that brief is a good bit of why we were so focused on getting a good. Um, the religion brief that Rebecca mentioned, a, a good brief about the legitimacy of, of public morality as a basis of, of legislation. Um, it was really, you know, in some ways, you might think surprising that the administration would take that, that tack. Part of it, I think you have to chalk up to abortion politics um, and a, a concern by the, the administration that uh, if states are going to legislate morality in the animal protection area. They may, uh, you know, seek to legislate morality in, in other areas as well. Um, it, there's also a sort of crossover, interesting crossover with the Little Sisters of the Poor and Hobby Lobby uh, cases that were in front of the Supreme Court, where, you know, businesses and the, the Order of Nuns, the Little, Little Sisters of the Poor, took the position that they couldn't in good conscience comply with the Obamacare contraception mandate because it would make them complicit in uh, activity, you know, namely contraception that they uh, were morally opposed to. And I think that the Biden administration probably, you know, didn't want to, to accept the, the legitimacy of that sort of, of objection uh, because it would, it would hurt them in the relig religious liberty cases about Obamacare. Yeah. It's really important. Maybe we can return to that if we have time towards the end. Um, but since we were talking about amicus briefs, uh, Ashton, you were involved in Harvard Animal Law Program's amicus brief and NPPC v. Ross on behalf of a group of animal, prote animal protection organizations and law professors. Can you talk about some of the strategies the program employed in the brief? Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much, Amanda. And it's it's really great to be here with you all. Um, <clears throat> and I should really preface this by saying that I was part of a, a team that worked on this brief. And um, Rebecca Garverman, uh, staff attorney at the Harvard Animal Law and Policy Clinic, and Kathy Mayer, the uh, clinic director, were the lead counsel here. Um, so, so I really want to, to to preface by saying that it was part of it was a ma major team team effort. Um, and so the brief had really two overarching aims, and and the first one. Um, you know, speaks to some of the things that we were just discussing about the Pike balancing test and really trying to emphasize what California's local interest, local moral interest was in enacting Proposition 12. And the second was to do some things that were a little more unique to the the, the freedom that's allowed in the in the amicus uh, context. And that was to bring some 
really cutting edge scientific studies to the attention of the court and also to bring a lot of visual media uh, to the court's attention and to use photos and videos to really emphasize our point in a way that is harder to do uh, in the main briefs. And so rather than focus on the doctrinal points, which I think we've heard um, a lot about, um, from other presenters, I, I think I'll focus a little bit on some of the scientific communication aspects of our brief and also the, the visual media aspects of our brief. Um, I think that was something that we were very excited about um, and you know wanted to, to bring to bear as best we could. Um, and so it's been known for, for several decades uh, that, that mother pigs learn to identify their children by voice call, um, but it's one of those facts that is incredibly charming and I, I never tire of hearing. And so we wanted to make sure to include that um, in the brief and give the court a sense of, you know, what pigs early lives are like, what that relationship is like. And that kind of, you know, really emphasizes the connection between the, the mother pig and, and, and her children. Um, and then also recent research, um, this is just, um, it was just a year before um, the 2023 decision, um, had classified this whole spectrum of different communications that um, pigs employ, the squeals and barks and grunts. And, and you know, sadly also, of course, when in extreme distress and when in confinement, their, their screams. Um, and this, this study had cataloged in really a very comprehensive and, and new way, the full repertoire of, of pig communication. I mean, I shouldn't say full, but close to, you know, fuller than previously known to, to science. And it was a really phenomenal um, study that we wanted to make sure to include uh, in the brief. And we were also emphasizing the incredible emotional capacities of pigs. And we wanted to show the ways in which their behaviors overlap um, quite um, substantially with uh, the behaviors of companion dogs, their emphasis in play, and, you know, retrieve sticks and roll in the mud and all these kinds of natural habitat, um, natural behaviors that pigs are able to do when in the appropriate habitat. Um, and pigs also show something that psychologists call emotional contagion, uh, and it's the ability to pick up on the emotional states of neighbors and those um, around them. And there was a really interesting uh, study that we, we brought to bear in the brief that essentially what the study did was it exposed uh, two populations of, of pigs to different um, kinds of music. And after each type of music, the pigs would get either a positive or a, a, a negative um, stimulus. And so in the positive case, they would get welcomed into this really wonderful room with other companions and food and places to play. And then when the other music played, they would get um, placed in a very you know, small area with no food, no um, no companions and something that they, they didn't like. And of course, you know, one, one can debate how kind some of these experiments are, but they do bring some really powerful evidence um, to bear that we can use uh, as best we can. And so then what happened in, in the study is they came and they brought in new pigs that hadn't been exposed to any of the kinds of music and placed them next to the pigs who had already been trained. And when those musical sounds played, the pigs that had been trained respond in the, responded in the ways that they had been trained to respond. And the other pigs that hadn't been trained exhibited the same responses. So with the positive things, they would get excited, you know, tail wagging and the negative, their ears would go back, some would urinate in distress. Um, and they were really picking up on what the other pigs um, were responding to without having been trained. And I think that, you know, the sense that we had is that this speaks, you know, very directly and tragically to the experience of a pig in extreme confinement pushed up against all its neighbors and experiencing the same kinds of, of, of distress um, that its neighbors feel. And so the amicus brief format also allowed us a lot of space um, to include extensive visual media. And so we wanted to really ground the court in images of pigs in gestation crates and the injuries that they sustain, um, the, the pressure sores, overgrown hooves. And we wanted the court to, to see what this looked like and get away from some of the, you know, very important of course, but the more abstract debates about square footage requirements, group individual housing. We wanted the court to really see, the justices to really see what this case was about and what goes on in, in these intensive um, confinement situations. And so we included a series of images of pigs in open air sanctuaries exhibiting more natural behaviors and then paired that with a, a series of images of, of pigs in um, instances of, of extreme confinement in gestation crates and, and the injuries um, that, that they sustained and it was quite um, gratifying we actually used a number of uh, images from um, Joanne MacArthur's We Animals Media who was a great uh, partner um, with, with us uh, on the brief 
And uh, Matthew Scully, a former uh, George W. Bush speechwriter, um, had written also an article that used some of her images as well. And Justice Gorsuch, in his opinion for the court, cited that article that included some of the same images. And so it was, you know, through some means or another, the court was able to engage with these images. And so that was very gratifying um, for us to to see. So yeah, that was our, our core approach. Use the amicus brief as kind of a platform for some of these cutting edge scientific studies and also as sort of a photo essay um, and links to videos and ways to get the court to really see uh, what happens on the ground um, with pigs being confined in, in the ways that they, that they are. So thank you. Thanks for providing all that context to us and then also to the court, <laughs> Ashton. <laughs> yeah, um, if I could just pick up really quickly on something Ashton said before we move on from there. Um, that was a huge benefit uh, to the case to be able to have these sort of other ways of um, getting things before the court that we either didn't have place for in our intervener brief or um, or it was otherwise advisable not to do. You know, you don't want to have a bunch of pictures of pigs in your primary brief um, uh, as a party in front of the Supreme Court. Um, uh, and so that was uh, that was a real benefit of that brief, and it's something that has uh, continued to benefit us. As a matter of fact, and Ashton, I don't even think you know this yet, um, we are filing a brief today in another case challenging one of our confinement regulations in Massachusetts that cites to um, your brief. Um, and it it is really important to be able to sort of have something to um point the court to that that uh, talks about some of those more visual, visceral things that really by the time you do get up to the Supreme Court, um, get a little bit lost or are a little bit absent, right? Like the a Supreme Court case is of course necessarily so much about the constitutional arguments that you're making and the power of persuasion of your legal points. Um, but at the root of it for the animal intervener groups, um, and indeed for a lot of our amici support, uh, is the inherent cruelty to animals that we are trying to get at through our various ballot initiatives and laws. So um, kudos to you for filing that brief, and it continues to be of use. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Becca. I'm really glad to hear that. And so I will, I will be following that case. <laughs> And that's actually a really good segue. So we've kind of been talking about the role of amici groups, um, but Kelsey, what does it mean to be an intervener in these cases? If the state's already defending the law and interested groups can submit those amici briefs, uh, amicus briefs, uh, why is it important to be a party to the litigation? Yeah, I think this is um, something that, you know, the Humane Society has been doing in a lot of the uh, ca cases, um, challenging, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, Amanda, there's been many constitutional challenges to many California animal welfare um, measures going back uh, years, maybe decades now. And um, and groups have, including the Humane Society, have very often intervened um, to be a party in the litigation, to stand alongside, you know, the state or the city or county, whatever the measure is, um, to defend the constitutionality of the, of the law. Um, so maybe to add some some law to this, um, intervention is governed by Federal Rule 24, um, and there's two different types of intervention. You can seek to intervene as a right, which is basically saying to the court, you know, because of the interest I have, you know, that's at stake in this case, you know, I and because that interest is likely to be, you know, impaired by whatever happens with with this case, I have a right to um, to intervene. Uh, and furthermore, because you know my interest isn't. 100% you know protected by the state like i have a somewhat different interest that only i can can protect um and when you can show that um you can uh you can join you know as a party which gives you the right to do everything a party can do so you know you're filing briefs just you know alongside the the state um at every stage of the litigation you have a right to appeal um so you really get a lot more say over the course of the litigation than you would if you just were an amicus, um, uh, you know, a, an interested party. Um, and I should say, there's also permissive in intervention, which is um, even if you don't meet the the standards of to intervene as of right, you can still intervene if um, if you uh, file a timely motion and if you um, show that you um, have a claim or defense that shares um, sort of a, uh, that, that shares with the main action, a common question of law or fact, which means like, you know, um, 
your, you, you know, you sort of want to join in the defense of, of, of the constitutionality of this provision, um, and you're going to be, you know, making basically uh, arguments that share a common nucleus of fact um, and law with, with, you know, what the, what the existing parties are going to be arguing. Um, and, you know, once you're into the case as an intervener, then you basically get to amplify, you know, this, the state's arguments, like you, you get to complement each other and just sort of think about the most strategic way to defend, you know, the law. Um, and so it's incredibly uh, beneficial for groups that um, have worked so hard to get these measures passed that uh, have spent a lot of money and time, you know, advocating for the measures to be able to stand alongside the state and defending them. Yeah, that's that's um, all so well said, Kelsey. And um, we uh, were very fortunate to have worked really well with the California AG's office um, in that case um, and continue to do so in some of our other legislative defense cases and, um, you know, cultivating that relationship and ensuring good cooperation um, and ensuring that the, the, the state knows that sort of the animal welfare intervener groups are a value add and that we're going to be able to um, you know, say some uh, say some things where they possibly can't or don't want to, and um, work together to sort of find out how to best complicate complement each other without being duplicative uh, is is really crucial. Thanks, you too. Um, which kind of brings the question since we're talking about animal welfare, Scott. What's the hardest question for the animal welfare side of the case? Would you say? Oh goodness. Um... I've uh, I've been consulting with the Humane Society about cases like this um, for more than a decade now, shark fins and shell eggs and foie gras and, and a long string of these cases. And, and the question that we in, invariably get asked at oral argument and that is probably the toughest is if California can restrict the sale in California of products because of inhumane treatment in uh, to animals and the way that they were produced elsewhere. Could California uh, pass a similar law that said you can't sell uh, products in California if they were made by people making less than $15 an hour elsewhere? Um, which, which is hard because it, it sort of shares some superficial structural similarities with Prop 12, um, but appears to threaten the core purpose of, of the Dormant Commerce Clause, which is to prevent for protectionism um, and, and economic discrimination by states against other states. It, we're supposed to be you know, a single common market and states aren't supposed to be preferring their own industries. I, I think the answer you know, is that the, the, that's just different. Uh, labor markets are just different because the core purpose of the Dormant Commerce Clause is to, to make sure that states can't prefer their own industries. And everybody, you know, understands, and this has been true, you know, from the ratification of the Constitution, it's been true that there are, you know, high cost, high wage states and, and lower cost, lower wage states. And one of the things that the Dormant Commerce Clause is supposed to do is protect, you know, whatever legitimate uh, price competitive advantage lower wage states have uh, in the production of, of goods. And we would not, you know, allow a, a state to sort of take that legitimate comparative advantage away with a, a law of the sort that I that I posited. Um, but in order to to say that Prop 12 poses a similar kind of problem, you sort of have to posit that a willingness to treat animals badly is a, a legitimate protected comparative advantage um, that you know the Constitution ought to be interested in in safeguarding. And, and I, I just don't believe that you can really argue that with a straight face. That's really well said. Thank you, Scott. Um, I, I had trouble with that like core question and nexus when, when I was listening to the oral argument. So you just put it so well. Thank you. It finally made sense. Um, Kelsey, the, the pork producers made an argument that the pork industry is too big to regulate. Can you describe that argument and whether you've seen it used in other contexts, particularly by the, the meat industry? Yeah, and I think Becca, Rebecca sort of touched on this earlier, so I won't repeat, but I think it's so ironic that their argument is essentially we're so big and so interconnected and so kind of 
efficient, for lack of a better word, that any kind of state, you know, intervention is going to like break the whole thing. And suddenly, because we can't, you know, kind of undo the, this, this, these machinations that we've, we've purposely built, suddenly, you know, um, every single producer is going to have to comply with Proposition 12. I mean, in addition to not quite passing the, you know, the basic logic tests, like, like Rebecca mentioned, as, and as the agricultural economists also pointed out, um, it's also just terribly ironic, because of course, as Rebecca said, they chose to structure their market in this way. And um, when I was researching, uh, you know, the kind of potential implications of this case, I came across a similar case um, out of uh, uh, Kentucky, actually, in the uh, at the Sixth Circuit. Um, and in that case, the court was looking at um, basically Kentucky wanted to go after price gouging, um, including against online sellers. And a bunch of Amazon sellers said, "Wait, wait, wait! You can't do that to us because." Amazon, you know, only lets us set prices across the whole country. And so if, if Kentucky, you know, it, yeah, you know, wants to make us not, you know, engage in price gouging, then we'll have to, you know, Kentucky will be setting a price for the whole country. And the and the district court agreed that that was a, a problem, um, a Domer Commerce Clause problem. And the Sixth Circuit said, wait a second, you know, the, the problem that you're talking about is Amazon's marketplace problem. It's not a, a, a constitutional problem that you have chosen to structure your market in such a way that if Kentucky wants to do something about charging, you know, a thousand dollars for toilet paper, you know, that's suddenly a constitutional issue. Um, so I think, you know, that case had really um, clear kind of analogies he here, where, um, you know, the 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 burden, if the burden is nationalized, um, and that is because it's difficult to segregate that is the fault of the structure of the industry, not Proposition 12. And, that, and to sort of answer the second part, yes, I mean, we do see that basic argument all the time, like, you know, any kind of regulation, however minute, is going to bring the entire industry to a grinding halt. I think we're seeing that right now with um, the EPA is finally, you know, after years, um, announcing very, very modest um, uh, new guidelines for slaughterhouse wastewater treatment. And you would think that the sky is falling and that the entire industry was going to um, was going to you know suddenly eva evaporate um, based on you know what the the meat and poultry processors are saying. Um, and it's again in this sort of theme of you know we're so big that even the most modest regulation um, is not only cost prohibitive but unconstitutional. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, we've been kind of dancing around this the whole conversation, but Scott, I think it's it's an understatement to say the court's decision is a bit fractured. <laughs> so can you help us understand uh, the holding there? Sure. Um, so the, the court splintered into, um, you know, several different camps. Um, you know, and and it's easy to sort of look at the opinion and and think, oh, this is very splintered. Um, on the other hand, you know, let's just start with the point that the court unanimously rejected the pork producer council's main argument. Their main argument was that because Prop 12 will have practical effects on what producers do in other states, it's extraterritorial. It's the you know legal and constitutional equivalent of directly telling people what they can do in other states. And the Supreme Court rejected that 9-0. The, the Supreme Court unanimously said, no, that's not what extraterritoriality means. Extraterritoriality means you know telling people what they can and can't do in other places. Um, you know, telling people what they would have to do in order to sell in your state is a regulation of sales in, in your state. It has nothing to do with extraterritoriality. It gets more complicated when the court gets to the pike balancing claim, right? So remember, Rebecca explained at the beginning that one of the strands of dormant commerce clause jurisprudence is this idea that if a, a law um, imposes burdens on interstate commerce that substantially exceed any local benefits, then that might be unconstitutional. Now, you know, that principle has only occasionally been applied. And when it's been applied, it has always been to the actual mechanisms and instrumentalities of interstate commerce, right? So there's 
There's a famous case about um, a state trying to legislate at the state level the length of interstate trains. And the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. The, the burdens outweigh any, any local benefits because trains are going to have to form and reform you know, with different numbers of cars when they're crossing state lines. There's a, a similar Supreme Court case about regulation of mud flaps on interstate trucks that you know, if one state has a particular rule for the size and placement of mud flaps on 18 wheelers that other states don't have, then trucks aren't you know, gonna have to swap out their mud flaps whenever they cross state lines. And we don't, you know, we don't permit that. But the Supreme Court has never quite said that the, the pipe balancing doctrine only applies to, to regulation of trucks and trains. So it, it leaves out this you know, possibility um, of judges just balancing the perceived benefits and burdens of of laws um, and striking down laws that where they think the the benefits you know are too small, um, the court fractured uh, about that, um, and you know the the big question in the case one of the big questions in the case was whether the pipe balancing claim was going to be sent back to the district court for more development. Or whether the Supreme Court could just say right now, no, that, that it's it's impossible. You can't possibly make out a claim here. And five to four, the Supreme Court rejected the pipe balancing claim and said, you're done. There's nothing to litigate here. But they split about the rationale. So there was one uh, group of, of justices, um, Justices Gorsuch, Thomas, and Barrett, who thought that... you. There's no point in trying to balance benefits and burdens in a case like this one because they're just incommensurable. How in the world are you going to weigh, you know, a concern about zoonotic plagues and concern about complicity and evil on the one hand against, you know, an extra 14 cents a pound for pork chops? There's just no way to balance those things. They're they're just too too different. It's like, you know, comparing a an apple and a and a skyscraper or or the color blue. Um, a different group of of justices, also including Gorsuch and Thomas, but not Justice Barrett, but picking up Justices Kagan and Sotomayor. So, how do you like that lineup? Gorsuch, Thomas, Kagan, and Sotomayor um, said instead that when the burdens of a law are not burdens on commerce itself, but merely on a method of doing business that certain participants in the marketplace like and other participants in the marketplace don't like, um, that doesn't count. So it, if you, you know, are essentially uh, passing a law that some will, will advantage some market participants o- over others, but doesn't you know, burden commerce, capital C, um, then you can't make out a, a pipe balancing claim. Well, okay, so Justice Barrett didn't agree with, with that, but there's four votes for it. Um, Justices Kagan and Sotomayor didn't agree with the point that, that the benefits and burdens are incommensurable. But if you add them all up, that's five votes. Gorsuch, Thomas, Barrett, Sotomayor, and Kagan for the result in the case. And the right way to think about the holding is that uh, if you have both of those things, if you have a law that is is both justified in part by morality or public health or something else that is incommensurable with economic burdens, and the the burdens imposed by the law fall on particular methods of doing business rather than capital C commerce, if you have both of those things, then there's no need to conduct a pike balancing analysis and the law is constitutional. And you know, indeed, Justice Kavanaugh, in, in his separate opinion in the case, you know, tried to suggest that it's unclear whether there's any real holding um, because the, the court fractured in that way. And footnote four in the, the majority opinion uh, takes direct aim at Justice Kavanaugh and, and basically says, don't let anyone tell you that there is no holding to this case. The holding of the case is if you put those two sections together, and the law has both of those features, then there is no viable pipe balancing claim. So it takes some some parsing, but the holding is actually pretty clear. Wow, I feel like I need a slow cough after that one. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
Ashton, uh, in your opinion, are there any aspects of the NPPC v. Ross decision about which animal protection advocates should be cautious? You're muted. Thanks so much, Amanda. Excuse me. Um, and yeah, th thanks so much, Professor Ballinger, for an excellent summary of the case and its uh, um, holding. Uh, I think indeed it was it was fractured in a constellation of these different opinions, um, but there, there's a lot to be to be taken there. Um, and so I would say, in terms of cautions, perhaps it's important to think about the ways in which Justice Gorsuch's narrow reading of dormant commerce clause precedents may pretend a narrowing of non non-dormant commerce clause precedent, so commerce clause proper, and how that could potentially threaten animal protection laws in, in the future. And so I think in this context, it's perhaps interesting to look at another case that was decided in 2023, I believe just two weeks after the MPPC versus Ross case. And this was the Sackett versus EPA case, which was a wetland case, um, which was dealing with section 404 of the Federal Clean Water Act. And the court in Sackett held the Clean Water Act did not apply to a wide swath of wetlands and smaller streams that regulators had long assumed fell within the scope of the act. And the majority, which was written by Justice Alito, uh, was grounded in, in statutory interpretation. Um, but Justice Thomas wrote a very lengthy concurring opinion, which was joined uh, by Justice Gorsuch. And so you see some of the similar overlaps that Professor Ballinger was talking about. Um, and on the Thomas Gorsuch view, you know, rivers, lakes, these traditional channels of commerce, those are the core commerce clause concerns for purposes of the Clean Water Act. But the destructions of wetlands on private property, which was the, the, the key part of this case, those are beyond Congress's reach to control. And a full rejection of New Deal era, you know, expansions in commerce clause doctrine would be a really major shift for the court. Um, but Justices Thomas and Gorsuch also drop a key line in that Sackett concurrence that I think should raise some alarms for environmental protection advocates. And the concurrence in particular notes that one law, and this is the Endangered Species Act, um, relies on a particularly extended view of the commerce power um, and one that might violate even the more expansive and permissive views um, that the court has articulated in, in recent years. And so, um, Justices Thomas and Gorsuch were, of course, you know, as Professor Ballinger noted, they were key to the, to the Ross decision, um, and they endorsed, you know, the most limited view, I would say, of the Dormant Commerce Clause. Professor Barrett is maybe in that, uh, Justice Barrett is maybe in that um, camp as well, um, but she was more amenable to the, to the burden question. So I think that Justices Thomas and Gorsuch really had the most narrow view of the Dormant Commerce Clause in Ross. And so it makes their views of the Commerce Clause proper particularly interesting and in that they were articulating those views just two weeks after the Ross opinion came out. And so in certain instances, like the proposed EATS Act, right, Congress's invocation of its commerce power can be a threat to animal protection uh, laws, but in others, and namely the Endangered Species Act, which is really the, the key question question here, Congress has enacted a number of strong animal protections that, is that are based on that commerce power. Um, and Justice Thomas's concurrence in Sackett, it essentially, you know, calls for the court to rule on the constitutionality of the Endangered Species Act, something that the court has avoided for, for many years, as it sort of percolated in the appeal courts, and it didn't really have the circuit split necessary. But there's been this like call out now in that Sackett case to say, Let's think about the Commerce Clause implications here. Um, I think it's a very interesting and potentially concerning pairing with, with Ross. And so it, of course, remains to be seen, you know, whether the court is interested in taking up a Commerce Clause challenge to the ESA. And Ross would not directly inform that analysis doctrinally. But within the fractured opinions, there are these kinds of methodological emphases and kernels of doctrine but I think that those taking a long view of animal protection uh, laws in a, in a sort of holistic manner should be keeping a, a watchful eye on. Thank you, Ashton. It's really interesting and kind of concerning. <laughs> Becca, uh, it's been, we've, we've talked about this way back at the beginning. Um, the MPPC Ross case is not the first challenge to California's confinement and sales laws, and it hasn't been the last. Can you talk a little bit about some of the cases that came before Ross and maybe more importantly, what cases are still on the table right now? Yeah, certainly. Um, so as most of this audience might already know, especially if you attended the first panel today, 
um, and I alluded to this a bit as well, um, you know, Proposition 12 is just sort of uh, the latest in California's very lengthy history of legislating for uh, the welfare of farm animals. And uh, it started way back in 2008 with Proposition 2. Um, and then two years later, the legislature passed AB 1437. Um, Prop 2 was uh, just very briefly a law that said that applied only to the confinement of animals within the state and had some similar um, sort of clear behavioral terms that are now in Proposition 12, um, but without any kind of set specific amounts of space per animal. In other words, it just said that uh, farmers could not confine pigs, egg laying hens, and veal calves in a way in which they could not stand up, lie down, turn around, and extend their limbs. When the legislature two years later passed 1437, it said that eggs sold in the state of California needed to come from those same conditions, no matter where they came from. Um, and so the early days after those pieces of legislation were in place and on the books in California saw a number of challenges, primarily at first from the egg industry. Um, and a lot of those early challenges had to do with constitutional vagueness. In other words, egg farmers saying that they essentially didn't know what it meant for a hen to be able to stand up, lie down, turn around and extend her limbs. Uh, and court after court rejected those on, in both federal courts and state courts. Um, and there's a really great quote um, by a U.S. District Court judge um, in a case uh, uh, by an egg farmer, or sorry, about an egg farmer by the name of Kramer um, that says that it's essentially crazy that as an egg farmer, you don't know what it means for a hen to be able to do these very basic behavioral movements. Um, and so after those cases were struck down one after another, we saw state attorneys general challenge this humane scheme, um, essentially bringing suits on behalf of their population, or at least purporting to bring those suits on behalf of their citizens, saying that, um, that these laws were constitutionally impermissible. And court struck those down, saying that uh, those egg farmers that essentially the states were saying they were representing could just bring those cases themselves and that it wasn't really on behalf of the population as a whole. Uh, the attorneys general tried to file an original jurisdiction action in the Supreme Court directly, and you might know um, that there are very few original jurisdiction actions that the court has uh, in its discretion taken up over the course of our of our country and it declined to take that one up. And so uh, you really saw in those early days a, a history of losses um, and uh, also an emboldening of animal advocates who thought, okay, well, if these laws have been upheld over and over again, maybe we can sort of dream of something bigger and better in terms of animal laws. And so that's how we got to Proposition 12. Um, and again, no, there was a whole panel on, on the lobbying and advocacy for that, so I won't go into that. But um, the NPPC case, as I mentioned, is the second one that sort of worked its way up to the Supreme Court, at least in terms of pork producer cases. The first one was brought by the North American Meat Institute had very similar dormant commerce clause claims, except that it also had a discrimination claim in the case. Um, and that's the one that Scott mentioned um, uh, also was sort of was denied by the Supreme Court. They did not grant cert. And that gave us at least some hope um, that perhaps they would not do so with at the NPPC case, which did not um, end up being the case, um, of course. And uh, so uh, that that case um, uh, is is over as well. And so in terms of remaining cases, I do want to highlight that although the Ross victory was huge for animal advocates and for the co the di diverse coalition of interests that help us pass this law, um, it certainly was not uh, the the last word on animal confinement uh, litigation. So, 
in addition to um, to the Ross case that that is now over, we are looking at a case from Iowa pork producers, which is pending in the Ninth Circuit. And that one brought a sort of whole litany of claims. It had Commerce Clause claims, it had vagueness claims, preemption, um, privileges and immunities, and uh, just sort of a whole uh, everything but the kitchen sink kind of thing. And uh, the district court and the Ninth Circuit tossed out that case, um, granted motions to dismiss, and um, and denied the pork producers' request for a preliminary injunction. Um, so we are awaiting, they appealed that to the Ninth Circuit, and we are awaiting an opinion on that. So that's sort of the, um, the West Coast side of things. And then over in Massachusetts, we are also uh, involved the, the same group of animal advocates that has been an intervener in um, most of these other cases we've been talking about, but especially the NPPC case today. Um, uh, those groups also tried to intervene in this case in Massachusetts, which is a challenge to the very similar question three. Question three was passed two years before Prop 12, and it um, looks very similar in terms of the coverage of species and the types of things that you can or not can or cannot do in the state of Massachusetts, very similar terms. Um, and so uh, Triumph Foods challenged that, that law, um, a, much like the Iowa pork producers case. Um, in fact, similar counsel in both cases. Um, it's sort of a laundry list of different complaints. And the federal judge in the Triumph case dismissed the majority of the claims brought by Triumph, but not all of them, unfortunately. Um, so without going into detail, because we don't have time to now, um, he did find for the pork producers in terms of a very limited part of question three that is sort of getting carved off of the law. Um, and reopened the issue of preemption in the case. And so Triumph filed a brief for summary judgment asking the court to find in its favor on preemption grounds, saying, in other words, that that the that question three cannot stand because federal law, in this case, the federal um, uh, the Meat Inspection Act um, preempts it. Um, and so we are briefing that case, but the animal protection groups in this case were actually denied intervention. So you'll remember that Kelsey talked about the different types of intervention that you might be able to get from a court. Well, often when a court denies intervention, they say, but basically feel free to file an amicus brief anyway. Um, and so that's what happened here, except that um, in the first circuit, there is a sort of special amicus status called amicus plus, which is something that we recently learned about <laughs> as of this case. Um, and so the animal welfare groups have fortunately been able to file briefs at every stage of this litigation rather than simply um, you know, in support of, of, of the state of Massachusetts in a sort of one shot kind of fashion. Um, and so that summary judgment briefing is wrapping up today. Um, we're filing the brief as we speak. I see emails in my box indicating that perhaps it is already filed. Um, and so we are, uh, we will then be awaiting a determination on what happens as to question three there. So the the more you win, uh, the more the challenges keep coming, it seems. And uh, we will we will keep fighting off those challenges as best we can. All right, thank you. That was so well said. Um, I think we're at about time. Um, do folks wanna stay around for one or two questions or do we wanna end? Okay, um, again, for folks that are joining us, feel free to drop something into the Q&A. But in the meantime, this has been so interesting for me, and I selfishly want to ask something because <laughs> I have some dormant commerce clause cases currently pending. Um, if memory serves, there was some language in the opinion about um, the purpose of the dormant commerce clause is to, you know, is discrimination to prevent discrimination on interstate commerce, and even pike balancing kind of like uncovers discrimination when you when you apply it. Um, so 
this might seem like a silly question, but it's not as silly as you think because of a recent decision. Um, so do you have to show discrimination even for pike balancing now? That wasn't my impression before. I think that's the best reading of the court's opinion. It, it, at a bare minimum, uh, the, the court is saying the vast majority of what we have been doing in the cases that we call pike balancing is really about discrimination against other states. And, you know, maybe we're not going to quite tell you that there's no such thing as pike balancing without discrimination, but that's always what we've been doing in the past. That's it. That's how I read it. Anyone read it differently? All right. Um, I think one more question, I guess. Uh, and is, I guess this is kind of a segue, is extraterritoriality dead after, after it's got this opinion, in anyone's opinion? You want I don't think so. I don't think totally dead. <laughs> I think the justices have some some confusion about where in the Constitution it might lie. But I think the basic premise that California can't say, you know, like, hey, Iowa, go do this without respect to anything that's happening in California is still is still. It's still part of the Constitution, possibly part of the Dormant Commerce Clause. Yeah, that's that's right. There are certainly um case, uh, there's a line of extraterritoriality cases that are mentioned in the opinion that certainly are not um, overruled or anything like that in this. Um, the justices simply found that um, that there is not extraterritoriality here, that it's very clear unanimously so um, that this is not one of those instances of extraterritoriality. I agree with you, Becca. A recent judge in one of my cases did not, but <laughs> we'll leave that there. I know I have a lot of uh, extra questions, but if we didn't get to your question or if you have ones and you know didn't drop it into the Q&A, please feel free to send us an email at events at ALDF.org. So it's about that time. So this concludes day one of the symposium. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, I am so grateful for this really uh, interesting and in-depth discussion. 